Today we'll talk about a subject that, boy, is, it's a tricky subject, and that's the subject of humility and what it is, it's opposite pride, and um, see if I can kind of help us get a good, working, simple definition of humility. So the word humble, interestingly enough, at least in the English Standard Version, which is what I use, the word humble occurs 87 times. The word pride occurs 87 times. Uh, I find that fascinating. Now, I realize that if you look at the Hebrew words, it's a little bit different on the count. But it is interesting that in the English Standard Version, both humility and pride occurred 87 times. And oftentimes, they're not in uh, the same, same verse. But I want to look at one verse, and then I want to talk about um, what the words mean. And I want to cover a couple misunderstandings about pride, uh, humility and pride. And then I'm going to give you what I think from something that happened to me um, a couple of months ago that's really been on my mind about this and it's helped me kind of see what these are. So in James chapter 4, verse 6, we read this. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I want to talk about this. You know, God resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. And when it says, therefore, it says, this is actually a quote from Proverbs 3.34. Now, if you go back to Proverbs 3.34, it doesn't read exactly like this. And that's because the Bible, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. But by New Testament times, most people didn't read or speak Hebrew. They read and spoke Greek. That was the language of the Roman Empire. And so they had translated the, the Old Testament into Greek. And so uh, James is quoting the Greek version. Uh, which is slightly different because, you know, things don't always transfer one-to-one -one in translations. And um, <clears throat> this is just like you quoting from the English, even though the Bible is originally written in Hebrew and Greek. And when I talk to you, I don't read the Hebrew or the Greek. I give you the English. Um, and so, same kind of thing. But let's talk about pride and humility. There are different terms that are used for pride, different descriptions in the Bible. There are different descriptions for humility. The basic idea is that pride is to be puffed up. Um, and humility is to be lowered down. So I guess that part's pretty easy. Um, but exactly how does that work out? How exactly does, does pride and humility, and, and does this mean that I can never say anything about anything good that happened to me because that's bragging and it's prideful? Good question. So let's talk about some misconceptions about pride and humility. <clears throat> First of all, humility is not always putting yourself down. The reality is, humility is never putting yourself down. Um, that is, a, it's, in some ways, it's a false pride. It's a false humility. Um, you are made in the image of God. Okay? I know you're sinful, but you are still the creature made in the image of God. And always putting yourself down as though you have nothing to contribute in a sense, it's putting God down because you're saying that God made somebody that has nothing to contribute. And I just don't believe that. So putting yourself down all the time, first of all, nobody wants to be around someone like that. And we're told to encourage one another. And if you're always putting yourself down, you're not encouraging others. So humility is not self-deprecation um, all the time. Always, oh, well, you know, I can't do that. Oh, I'm not very smart. Oh, everybody's better than me. You know, that, that, that is not, that, that's, that, that's, that's not humility. Um... Humility is, you know, like putting others first. I mean, sometimes we put ourselves down by putting others first, but not in really put myself down, just I want to put the attention on someone else. Now, let's take the opposite of that. Pride is not always, um, or, or excuse me, let me put it this way, bragging on yourself is not always pride, or bragging about something is not always pride. So, for example, it just thrills me that I have four children who are all grown and married, and we're all in church Sunday. And on any typical Sunday, they're all in church. And I have nine grandkids. Someone said pride is always a sin except in grandparents. Um, I am proud of my children. I am proud of my wife who carried the bulk and the heavy load of raising our children. Um, and so there, there's, that, that's not... That's an English use of pride that really doesn't match what the Bible talks about. Um, 
Being thrilled and excited about accomplishments is not pride. If you worked hard on a science project at school and you won first place, it's not pride to post on social media, hey, I got first place. It's not, you know, you're excited about it. Other people should be excited about it with you. Now, saying, yeah, I beat everybody else. I knew nobody stood a chance against me. That becomes pride. That, that's an attitude kind of issue. But the reality is celebrating your accomplishments um, is not pride. We want to celebrate with you. I've been to several um, Eagle Scout ceremonies for young men in our church who have spent years and untold hours working towards this, uh, and they've achieved their goal. And I want to be there to celebrate with them. And it's not prideful to say, hey, I earned Eagle Scout. It, it's, it's great. Um, and uh, we should want to celebrate with them, uh, you know, uh, to celebrate, hey, I'm getting married and, and you know, or whatever, I got a promotion. Uh, I graduated. Let's say there's nothing wrong with celebrating achievement. There is a problem in feeling like you're better than everybody else or, yeah, there's no big deal. I can handle this kind of thing. You know, oh, yeah, it's, it's not like that. Or I know something you don't. Um, or I accomplished something you didn't. It's not like that. It's, it's not like comparing with other people. That's where pride comes in. So don't, don't, don't think that somehow you can never celebrate accomplishment, yours or other people's, because that's um, somehow sin, or that always putting yourself down is somehow godly. That, that's not the case um, at all. Um, I mean, not at all. And Jesus walked on water and they saw him. That wasn't an act of pride. Jesus fed thousands with a couple of loaves, uh, and some fish, and, you know, five biscuits and a couple of sardines. That wasn't pride. It was celebrated by him and other people. Jesus even referenced it again later in his ministry. But Jesus didn't say, yeah, I can do this because I'm son of God, but the rest of you morons. It's not like that. That becomes pride, and Jesus was not prideful. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> understanding that that's not really what we're talking about. It's not always putting yourself down, um, or it's somehow there's something wrong with celebrating achievements and accomplishments and all. Um, that's not the case. What then really is pride and humility? So let me see if I can help us understand by something that happened to me um, recently. In addition to being the pastor here at First Baptist Chandler, for over two decades, I've also been a professor at Gateway Seminary. <clears throat> now, if you don't know, a seminary is a graduate school for pastors. So... Uh, with a few exceptions, our students have graduated from college. So this is, it's graduate school. Uh, it's not a Bible college. It's, just, it's master's level and PhD level. That, that's what we do. When I came to Gateway, all we had was the master's degrees. Uh, and there were several of them. Uh, MDiv being, Master of Divinity being the primary one. You know, we learned Greek and Hebrew and that stuff. And so, um, you know, we all teach in the MDiv program. Well, uh, a few years into my tenure, there was a move by some of the administration and some of the faculty to begin a PhD program. And so they was just going to start with just a PhD in Bible, either Old Testament or New Testament. It has since expanded to include also a PhD in church history or a PhD in theology. Um, and we've even looked at expanding beyond that. But they, at that point, that was what we were going to do. And they wanted... Um, uh, you know, a couple people from administration, and they wanted a New Testament professor and an Old Testament professor to be a part of designing the program. And so I was asked to be the professor to, uh, the Old Testament professor, to help uh, design this program. And so uh, when you serve on a committee at the seminary, it's a three-year stint. And so I did my three years I was very heavily involved in designing the PhD. Some of my ideas were accepted, some were rejected, some were modified. I helped to modify others. We've worked out how we were going to, um, you know, do this degree. And then, and, and then we launched it, and then I was requested to serve an additional three years. So I'm the only person to ever serve six straight years on uh, the PhD committee, which is called the Ag Academic Graduate Studies Committee. Um, so I was very involved in it. Um, I have done some teaching at the PhD level. I have tutored numerous PhD students, particularly those who are struggling 
uh, with very advanced Hebrew to be able to get their Hebrew language skills up to the level needed to earn a PhD. And um, I'm very, I'm proud of them because those students will actually come into Arizona and I'll give them a couple of days for two or three hours in the morning and we will work through many of the very, very technical stuff with Hebrew to help them be prepared to pass their comprehensive exams. And I've also had the opportunity to supervise dissertations. Now, dissertation is the, basically it's a book that you write on some really detailed little thing. Like my dissertation was on God's self-revelation through clouds in the Old Testament. So it's not some big subject. It's usually a pretty narrowly defined subject. And this person writes about a 175-page book on it that is at the highest levels of uh, academic rigor. I very much enjoyed that. I have enjoyed supervising dissertations. I really enjoy working with PhD students. Um, the way I teach fits better at a graduate school than at the college level, and that's just kind of the way God designed me, and I really admire those professors um, who deal with college-age students who are just out of high school and all. Um, it takes a very, very special person to be able to do that. And so, uh, but I like the, where I'm at. And, you know, God always puts us where, where we seem to fit best. And so, um, in the last couple of years, I've had, uh, I mean, last year I had three separate students who are uh, beginning or about to begin a PhD program saying, I would like for you to be my supervisor all the way through my dissertation. I'm like, man, I'd be more than happy to do that. Then I was informed by the head of the degree that they don't want me to do it anymore. Um, that I will not be supervising any more dissertations and will not be involved in the PhD program anymore. I've been doing this about 15 years, and I'll be honest with you, it hurt, and it hurt deeply. Um, no reason was given, just some of the people on the committee feel this way, and like, okay, um, I'm not going to go around and try to round up support to, you know, it's like, okay, if that's how it is, that's how it is, that's fine. Um, at least that's sort of the face and all I'll put on. But I'll tell you, it bothered me greatly. It bothered me greatly. Why would they not do that? I think I'm academic enough because I'm also a full-time pastor. Um, it's a personality thing. Has there been a complaint filed somewhere that I'm not aware of? Um, did they go back and think that the dissertations that I have supervised weren't up to snuff? I mean, I don't know. I'm not really sure why. And so it, it bothered me for several weeks. And then I kind of got this lightning bolt moment from God that's really, I think, helped my spiritual life tremendously. It's like these words came right out of heaven into my brain. And I don't believe that this is additional revelation. This is all the revelation we need. But this phrase hit me, just hit me. Pride worries what other people think. Humility worries what God thinks. And it just kept resonating in my life. And I realized that I'm upset because of what other people think. Therefore, it is a pride issue. It's just purely pride on my part. Um, I don't need to worry what they think. I need to worry what God thinks. Have I done my best before the Lord? So humility is not self-deprecation. Humility concerns that what does God think? Pride always worried what do other people think. Do they like me? Do they accept me? Are they impressed by me? Um, you know, all those kind of things. No. We need to worry about what God thinks. So I'm going to encourage you. First of all, be encouraging and celebratory with people that have had achievements and accomplishments in life. We should celebrate with them. Because you know what? When I've had accomplishments, I've enjoyed people celebrating with me. And don't feel guilty. That's not pride. Don't put yourself down all the time. All right, don't put yourself down at all. Um, people don't want to hear that. Um, you know, if I honestly say, I can't do that. I mean, I'm five feet eight, and um, because I'm five eight, that means I need a step ladder in my house to change light bulbs and such. I mean, I'm just honest. Um, you know, there's some things that, because I'm not tall, I'm not able to do. Uh, but that's not self-deprecation. That's just, you know, honesty, and you know, I'm just not able to do that. Um, and obviously playing in the NBA, um, 
But, but don't just put yourself down all the time. That's not humility. Instead, remember this. Pride worries what others think. Humility worries what God thinks. And we need to be people of humility. We need to be concerned, what does God think? Am I living my life to impress others or am I living my life to please God? And that has just been resonating in my mind really for about two months now. And I'm trying to look at my life and evaluate and ask, really, what am I doing? Do I want people to be impressed with my preaching or do I want to be faithful to what God wants me to do? Do I want people to be impressed with how much I know because of my professor or do I just want to do what God has called me to do? I, ho- I hope, you know, I look at myself, am I doing these Theology Thursdays because this is what God wants me to do? Um, he's given me a skill and the gifts to understand the Bible and to be able to help other people understand it. Um, and so am I using those to please God or do I want people to be impressed with what I've done? Like, man, I look at my own life. And so I want to encourage you to look at your life and ask yourself, am I living for others or am I living for God? Am I concerned with what others think or am I concerned with what God thinks? Am I obsessed with what other people want or expect or am I obsessed with what God wants and expects? So I'm, I'm hoping that my life will be a life of humility that's concerned with what God thinks, not so much with what others think. And so I hope that will be the case for you too. I hope that you will live a life, not of pride that worries what others think, but a life of humility that worries about what God thinks. So God bless you. I hope this helps you. And hope you have a wonderful, fantastic day and week.